Welcome to the Lifestyle Medicine Update. I'm Dr. James Machino. Let's talk about the gluten-free movement that's so popular today. You know, gluten is a combination of two proteins found in wheat and some other grains. Now, gluten is actually comprised of two different types of proteins. They are gliadin and glutenin, and it's the gliadin protein that causes the problem in celiac disease. Now, celiac disease is a, it's an autoimmune disease whereby the gliadin fraction of gluten causes an abnormal immune response in the small intestine, producing a pretty serious inflammatory reaction that damages the lining of the gut, which then interferes with the absorption of many nutrients. So any combination of, of abdominal symptoms, such as chronic diarrhea, abdominal distension after meals, weight loss, growth failure in children, and anemia are very common manifestations. Now, testing for celiac disease involves a simple blood test but that it still requires confirmation after the blood tests are positive for of an intestinal biopsy which needs to be performed. But the blood tests to get started, the ones recommended by the Canadian Celiac Association are the, the TTG test, which is sort of the tissue transglutaminase antibody test, also the IgA immunoglobulin test and the EME test, which is the anti-endomesial antibody test. So that those are the three that are recommended. Now, first-degree relatives of patients with celiac disease should also be screened using these simple blood tests, as celiac disease can be present without any symptoms, uh, and often in biological siblings, parents, and children, about 10 to 15 percent of celiac first-degree relatives like this have celiac disease. Now, this is important to get tested because um, celiac disease, if it's unmanaged, uh, significantly increases the risk of a type of cancer known as lymphoma arising in the small intestine, as well as cancers of the liver, the oral cavity, and the large intestine. Now, the primary management of celiac disease, if, you test, if, if the blood tests are positive, confirmed by intestinal biopsy, is to avoid all food sources of gluten, which include wheat, barley, bulgur, Oats, even though oats don't contain gluten themselves, they're often processed in plants that produce gluten containing, uh, with gluten containing grains that may contaminate the oats. Also, rye and a couple of lesser known uh, grains contain gluten. And gluten may also show up in ingredients uh, in barley malt, uh, chicken broth, malt vinegar, some salad dressings, in veggie burgers if they're not specified gluten free, and in soy sauces. It may even be hiding in some common seasons and spice mixes. So the question is, what percentage of the population actually have celiac disease? Well, only about 1% of the population. And another 1% of the population have what's known as a wheat allergy, where they, can, they can't eat wheat, but they can have other gluten-containing foods. So these people typically have these what are known as atopic symptoms, where they often suffer from hay fever, they easily break out in hives, they have eczema or asthma. And these conditions are made worse often from eating wheat. So there's a simple blood test for wheat allergy that is often included in the celiac testing profile to help distinguish simple wheat allergy from true celiac disease. However, in 2012 a new health condition was recognized and published. It's called gluten sensitivity or gluten intolerance. So it's a condition that mimics the symptoms of celiac disease, but the blood tests and biopsy tests don't show the presence of antibodies or celiac damage to the intestinal tract. So the person tests negative for celiac disease, but they're still sensitive to some degree to the presence of gluten. So researchers estimate that about 6% of the population have this type of gluten sensitivity. So in these cases, avoiding gluten-containing foods seems to improve gastrointestinal symptoms such as post-meal bloating, frequent diarrhea, cramping pain or discomfort, associated joint pain and fatigue. So gluten sensitivity is, seems to be very common in people that have irritable bowel syndrome. And when they avoid gluten, in these cases, it really helps the IBS symptoms. But not all the patients that have irritable bowel syndrome actually have a gluten sensitivity. So if a person has irritable bowel syndrome, they should probably avoid gluten-containing foods and see if it helps them or not. It's not going to help everybody. It'll probably help a certain percentage of those patients. There's also some evidence to suggest that gluten sensitivity may trigger symptoms in some patients that have schizophrenia or autism spectrum disorder. So it might only be a small percentage of these patients who benefit, but it's probably worth a simple trial to see if avoiding gluten enhances the treatment of schizophrenia and or improves the symptoms in cases of autism. For everyone else, if you have abdominal symptoms, the ones that I've mentioned, and your doctor has run all the battery of tests and can't find anything, 
then you may simply have a gluten sensitivity, in which case it would make sense to avoid gluten-containing foods to see if it helps. But remember that. Between celiac disease, wheat allergy, and gluten sensitivity, together they account for less than 10% of the entire population. So for most of us, gluten doesn't appear to be a problem. So spending a lot of effort on locating gluten-free foods is really not necessary for the majority of the population according to the research that we have. I know that it makes, and the other thing is that to make gluten-free foods, you often have to add extra fat and carbohydrate calories to replace the gluten so the food doesn't crumble and fall apart. And the extra fat and the extra sugary calories might actually do more harm than the gluten if you're not actually sensitive to gluten. So, um, you know, it's not necessary for everybody to become gluten-free according to the research. Now, there's a lot of hype today about gluten as being a food toxin that destroys everybody's health. Now, this appears to be true for less than 10% of the population. For the rest of us, it doesn't seem to truly be a problem. Now, if you're interested in going gluten-free, if you've had any of these abdominal symptoms, um, then I provided a list of gluten-free uh, foods that you can include in your diet in the text below. I've also included the links to the most recent published data on gluten sensitivity and some other helpful resources. So until we meet again, I'll encourage you to eat smart, live well, and I know you're going to look and feel great. Thanks for watching.